So I got 10 minutes to wait for the official time, and there were a few uh, interesting news articles. Now, this guy's referring to something that happened a few months ago. A security expert who uses the handle hack for pancakes <coughs> got told that her whole apartment building was going to be turning into smart apartments and installing all this IoT stuff. And she complained about all sorts of intelligent concerns. And according to this guy, it's gotten better. They did the same thing to him. He came home to find a uh, flyer on his uh, door saying they're about to install all this junk um, thermostats, light door, all connected to an app. And he asked them a lot of concerns like, uh, is there a battery backup? Can I opt out? What if I don't like it for various good reasons? And he got an intelligent answer. Uh, he can opt out. They have something called Sabbath mode. Uh, for observant Jews, which I guess is something about how they can't be opening the door with an app on the Sabbath or something like that. But anyway, it does sound like um, some of this rush to home-based IoT is beginning to show some intelligent concerns about privacy and individual preference. So that's comforting. And I know that I've seen the same thing. Uh, it used to be that when I reported vulnerabilities, I had a 2% chance of them ever fixing it and a less than 1% chance of getting any response at all. And now that's gotten up to maybe 5 or 10% that actually respond and say they're going to fix it or something. I don't know how many of them actually do, but it is slowly becoming more uh, common that they actually understand there is something called security. When people have a security report, you should actually listen to it instead of just throwing it away. So uh, this Clearview AI um, is a company that was highly controversial. They were scraping data for faces everywhere and making a giant database of it all, like all the Facebook data in contradiction of Facebook's terms of service and so on. And then um, they made it available to law enforcement. And one thing I was sort of glad to see in this article, law enforcement said this thing is fantastic for helping uh, kidnapped children and exploited children, which, um, so it's not, I don't want people to think there's only one side to this, but anyway, a lot of people got upset about the privacy consequences. And um, now they've leaked out their client data. They don't give much detail, but uh, an intruder gained authorized access to its list of customers. And so that's uh, a, another breach. And that's, of course, another concern is not only is it a worry that people are collecting this kind of data and the kind of data that goes in those DNA databases, but they also tend to do something foolish, like just put it in an open cloud bucket or something and let people steal it. So there are a lot of issues about this. Anyway. Um, Here's an interesting class. Um, they have a class for older Americans. Studies have shown that older Americans fall for, face, for fake news a lot more than younger Americans. And they're giving them classes where they show them fake stories and then send them to places like Snopes.com where they can research them and teach them how to test for the accuracy of things on the internet. It sounds like a really good idea, uh, especially in these days when a great many people believe false political stories. <coughs> it seems like a fine thing to do. And I'm sort of like the education angle. Um, so Huawei can no longer get Google software, like Google apps on their phones, because of the American embargo against Huawei. And so they have made their own Android Play Store, and they claim it is popular, which I'd imagine it probably is true if you can't get the other one in China. I've heard all along that there are special third-party stores you go to in China, which is a gigantic market because they can't connect to the Google Store. And um, so anyway, they have their own marketplace. I know I haven't looked at this one, but I have looked at the Kindle Fire marketplace, and it is just hilarious. The apps are two years out of date. They don't have any patches. It is, uh, I always thought that if I can't find good vulnerable versions of apps to hand out to people, I just go there. I think they're all pretty vulnerable. And I guess there are yet more third-party Android marketplaces. And the thing that concerns me about them, of course, is not only are they probably full of malware, like all Android marketplaces, they're probably never updated properly. And I uh, wonder if the people that write the apps are even the people that put them in those stores. Anyway, there's a raccoon malware that will infect your computer and steal data from all common browsers, apparently. Sounds pretty good. It would be fun to find out how it works. Not apparently not very complicated, written in C++, and it will steal even from things like Opera and SeaMonkey and UC Browser, even uh, not what you think of as the top browsers, and it'll steal the data from the wallets and so on. Uh, it'd be, I'd certainly like to uh, analyze this stuff. Good to find out more about how it works. 
uh, the MI5 chief is asking again for access to encrypted messages. Um, as usual, most people are dead set against this and say it should totally be blocked, and I'm not so sure. He even mentions, people have mentioned already, um, something that uh, Steve Gibson said on Security Now that I thought made sense, is that WhatsApp already has the ability for three-way encrypted chat. So they already have the technology to send a copy to a third party, and that third party could be an invisible copy for the cops. And that's what he wants them to do. And um, you can say they shouldn't do that, or there should be some restriction on it. But when they claim it is not technically possible to do it, that is a very hard uh, claim to justify. It seems to be obviously true that it is technically possible to do it. And uh, anyway, we'll see where all this goes. So that in case anybody didn't know this, uh, the US military takes North Korean and Russian malware and they publish it publicly on virus total in or when they decide that they just want to humiliate or reduce its effectiveness, they dump it publicly. So we'll get in the normal antivirus engines and such. I don't know why anybody's surprised by this, but anyway, I guess there were some people that thought they would keep all the stolen malware secret and they don't keep it all secret. They dump some of it publicly making a decision of what would best benefit them. This I thought was very cute. Um, the musicians generated every possible melody and released them to the public domain to try to end the a concept of music copyright. I don't know how much this will work. It would be interesting to see what a lawyer says. I saw a cartoon strip 10 years ago that I had a version of this where a guy writes one song called Zero and one song called One and copies them both and then claims all the music in the world. I imagine that courts will not accept this, but it is a kind of funny idea. So this company called PetNet had some kind of internet connected dog feeders. Why ever you would do that, sort of like the internet connected toilets that I'm hearing a lot of ads for. But anyway, then they went offline, so they quit working. And then they didn't even answer any of the protests of uh, people using their stuff for about a week. So uh, this is one of several cases of this. You buy some uh, junky internet of things stuff that you count on and then the company just abandons you. There was a thermostat, I think the Google thermostat, the Nest, I think, where they announced it was um, going to become obsolete and they were going to stop supporting it and all the money people had invested in it would be lost. There's quite a storm about that, although I think they said at some point that it would continue to function to some extent, but you lose the advanced functions or the ability to configure it or something like that. I saw this earlier. Um, the cops put a GPS tracker on somebody's car claiming they were a drug dealer. And then when the person removed it from the car, they called that theft and used that to get a search warrant to search for the stolen tracker and then found the drugs all searching for the stolen tracker. And the, the judge ruled in something that certainly sounds sensible to me that that is not theft. If you find some unauthorized device attached to your car with no label on it or anything, you have the right to remove it and that is not theft. And you cannot justify a search warrant on the grounds that somebody stole your tracker in such a case. That's somewhat comforting, I suppose. And uh, this one I thought was very interesting. Um, the apparent, this was apparently a talk at RSA. I didn't go, but they summarized it here. They found a lot of uh, credentials being mismanaged. And they mentioned um, SSH keys. Uh, engineers typically connect in with SSH keys, but apparently they're not keeping track of them. And he said they found one company had 4 million SSH keys and they had no idea who was using them or how many of them were really invalid or how many copies had been made of them or anything. And that, of course, is a bad thing. Uh, this is why uh, it is real useful to achieve compliance where you actually have to keep track of how many employees you have and who are they when they log in and keep a log of it all and audit it all. It's a whole lot of work to get organized like that. But until you do that, it's ridiculous to think you can secure your stuff, just like you have to do an audit and find out how many copies there are of your sensitive data if you want to have any control of it. Anyway, that uh, thought Scolia gene GPS tracking illegal. I do not know about that one. Uh, that is an interesting issue. If um, I don't know, I'd be interested to see articles about that, uh, Jimmy. Um, I think the cops use a lot of identity, uh, location tracking with and without warrants all the time. So I think quite a lot of it is legal. Uh, I think there are some restrictions on it, but um, certainly they do place trackers on cars. So it's possible to get some kind of legal authorization for that, but I'm not sure exactly what you have to get. 
All right, anyway, we're up to 10 minutes after. I'm gonna to go to the official content here. So I'm doing my classes only by Zoom this week because I've got a strange, nasty cold and I don't wanna be spreading it in a time when everybody is very nervous about these things. So I'll just do the classes remotely this week and hopefully be back in action as normal next week. And so today we're going to just finish up. We're here. We're gonna finish up attacking Android applications. And uh, I've got the slides here. It probably won't be a very long lecture, but I, I really want to cover these topics. These are the leftover ways to attack Android applications. And these are somewhat exotic ones of which we've only put a few in the projects, but I always try to put in the projects as much as I can. So we're in the third section here, storage and logging, insecure communications, which we do cover, and other vectors and additional testing techniques. I should mention uh, that one of the students has been finding yet more hidden secrets inside apps. Um, more API keys. So I'm going to continue to research that. And I have written two API projects for the Thursday class. And I'm, it's turning out to be far more difficult than I had imagined to really get APIs to work correctly and understand exactly how important the secrets are. It's going to take a while. It's pretty easy to find secrets hard-coded in apps. It is much harder to decide exactly how dangerous they are. Anyway, so storage and logging, we've talked about this. There's local storage where people put things. The file and folder permissions are the standard Unix permissions. So if you do LX minus L, you have RWX, RWX, RWX. And where you see a letter, that activity is allowed. And where you see a dash, it is not allowed. So this um, packages.list has read write permission for the owner and read for people in the same group as the owner and no permissions for anyone else. Um, the last three are what you call world readable, writable, and executable, where you let everybody in the world access it. And in general, that's considered a bad idea. So uh, you can do it with numbers. This is in base eight, or one, two, and four for adding up to seven here, and one, two, and four, and one, two, and four. So 777 is world readable by everybody. 755 is everybody can read and execute it, but only the owner can write to it. And 644 is what you might do for a public data file. Everybody can read it, but only the owner can write to it. Those are probably the most common combinations you see. Uh, there is this weird thing called a U-mask, which determines the default permissions for newly created files and folders on the system. The uh, default permissions are the opposite of the U-mask for some reason. So if the U-mask is 7.7, then by everything by default has the opposite, read, write, execute for the owner, but no permissions for anyone else. Anyway, um, you can adjust the UMAX on any Linux or Unix-based system, and that will change the permissions of newly created objects, but this is the default value. Another issue is traversal checking, which is on in Linux and Unix and off by default in Windows, which says that if you put an object in a folder, it is only readable by people who have read permissions to that folder and all the containing folders. So the, this is not true on Windows, which is strange and bizarre and has bad consequences and therefore it's on in Unix. The idea being if you make a folder and you make it private, then even if subfolders are created in there later, they're still private until the containing folder has its permissions changed. All right, so DroidWall is an example of the many times, almost all privilege escalations rely on this single flaw that you have some high privileged application which is taking, which is running, and there is some way to inject data or command into that application, even the lower privilege. So DroidWall is some kind of uh, Android firewall using IP tables, and it made a script with 777 permissions. And therefore, this means not only can everyone run it, but it always runs as root, and everyone has write privileges to it, which is the problem. There's, I don't see why any low privileged users should be allowed to write to it. And so what you could do is you could just write commands into this file and the DroidWall app would eventually come by and execute what was in that file. So it was a way to trick the system into running high privilege commands. Uh, Android has the ability to encrypt files, but if you, the most common case, just like uh, most SQL transactions, if you use something called SQL Cypher, you can encrypt it. But if you look at the official documentation, the example tells encrypt it here with a password of test one, two, three. So if you just follow the example, you're hard coding the key in the app. So all people have to do is run strings on your app, and then somewhere in there is the real key, and so they can decrypt it. This is the kind of thing I've been talking about for the last several weeks, these hard coded keys in apps. A lot of people use them. It is the easiest way to write code. 
and um, I'm planning to go a lot more deeply into it if I can. It's going to be my next project for this class and the Thursday class to really understand those secrets and come up with some good references and example vulnerability reports to try to make it very clear, explaining to people what they should do instead and why they should stop doing this. Anyway, uh, you can also put data on the SD card. I don't know how many people still have SD cards in the phone, but anyway, SD cards are formatted like floppies. They don't have any intrinsic permissions available on the SD card. So the only permission is the operating system. And in early versions of Android, I think before 4.4, you needed a permission to write to the card, but you didn't need any permission to read from it. All Everything on the SD card was world readable. And I know at that time, the Nessus app actually put a password on the SD card where everyone could see it, which was pretty much an embarrassment for security product. Now, 4.4 and later, there was a special permission needed to read external storage. So that gives you some control of it, although it certainly is not granular. It doesn't appear to be any way to specify which application would be allowed to read each file or anything. In general, I don't know why you're putting anything on the SD card anyway. It's a, considered a pretty unsafe place to put things like the log. Uh, so WhatsApp storage database on there and uh, they used custom encryption, which is another lame thing everybody does. So they encrypt it with AES, but that just means you have to hide the AES key somewhere and they just used a static key, which was found. So a hacking tool could just decrypt it. Uh, that is true of something like half of all the apps I've examined that they encrypt something important with private key encryption and then they hide the key someplace you can find it. So it's not really a whole lot better than storing it in plain text. And we've been doing a lot of this in this class, putting Trojans in apps to log secrets, which is considered a poor activity. Although to be fair, uh, after Android 4.1, logs are no longer available to every app on the phone. So you could argue that putting things in the log is not such a bad idea, but it certainly is not recommended. All right. And so you can actually grant this permission to something. So it has permission to read the logs, but you have to be root to do that. And then we talked a lot about insecure communications. Of course, if things, unencrypted data is sent out over Wi-Fi, then all you have to do is run Wireshark and sniff in promiscuous mode or get in the middle and run BERT or any of a lot of things. Same thing if you use HTTPS without validating a TLS certificate, you can easily intercept and steal that data with BERT as we've done before. So even though GenieMD is using HTTPS, it does not validate the certificate, so we can use a fake certificate from BERT, send it the wrong encryption key, and now we can see the secrets uh, in, with the man in the middle attack. Uh, the recommended procedure for a long time to prevent this has been certificate pinning. The app can have custom code that in addition to the default tests for HTTPS has a second test to make sure that certificate is what it really should be. And that way it's, um, even if you've installed a trusted certificate to tell it to trust BERT, it still won't trust it. And so if you want to overcome that, there are common ways to do it. Um, the simplest one is put it in a trusted certificate store, which will not work if they're using that custom pinning. Um, overriding a package from the custom cert is the same. Using Frida would more likely do it or reversing the code. Uh, Frida, we've got a couple of projects using it a little bit. Frida hooks the operating system calls, sort of like moving your app into a virtual machine so that when it makes operating system calls, it goes to different code that does something different than it's expected to. And that's one way to hack apps without actually changing any of the code in the app. And then there's the activity we've done quite a bit in the project where you actually modify the code, recompile the app, and create a modified version of the app that no longer contains the test. And we're doing that for the MAD HAR app. Uh, so a lot of apps are distributed with broken HTTPS. They don't really validate it. Um, so it's pretty rude. They've either coded it with some kind of dummy uh, module that always says the app is matched or something else of that nature. They've somehow invalidated it and then left it that way for final distribution. Uh, web views is another thing in quite a few of these apps where you can open a page. It's actually a web page, but it opens inside the app. This gives a better user experience than leaving the app and going to the browser, which kind of causes you to lose control of your customer. And it technically uses WebKit or Chromium inside the app. And so it's now running a little browser inside the app. And you can now just do things like disable TLS. You can, inside your app, you can define a web settings class that controls how this works. So you can specify that it's allowed to contact content providers like databases, um, 
It's allowed to access, you can call it from file URLs. Uh, you can let JavaScript run inside your app's internal WebKit browser. You can turn in plugins like Flash, although I don't know how many people are still using Flash. And uh, you can even save passwords in the web view, which would save them somewhere in your app's directory, I guess. Um, and so those are, uh, since you are now running a little browser inside your app, you've got some attacks. Is it possible to control the code being executed in EggView, like sign or hash verification? I don't know. It's a good question. I haven't seen any options like that, but I haven't uh, written any actual apps that do this, so I don't know. It's a good question. Anyway, so you, if you load any content over HTTP, you can man in the middle it, modify it, and add JavaScript. So now you could be running JavaScript in, or any other script inside the page that the developer did not put there. And you could also send an intent from another app, opening it, sending it. See if it's going to accept intents from other apps and open URLs, which are what some of those permissions allowed, then you could send something from a malicious app, which would then launch that app, launch the WebKit, and run code in there. And if that's not bad enough, you have JavaScript interfaces. You can put this in your app where you allow JavaScript in WebKit inside the app to call Java code in your app. So you can expose your internal app methods to control from the internet. And if this sounds familiar to you if you've been taking my other classes, it should. This is exactly what Microsoft did with DCOM, Distributed Component Object Model. Originally, you'd have an app with some modules that were only running inside the app, and then Microsoft made it possible to publish that to other apps on the computer, and then to other apps on the network and the internet. So code that was originally inside one program is now exposed to the world, and this led to a lot of exciting new functions and the ability to make money reselling your code, but of course, also security problems. And the same thing's true here with these JavaScript interfaces. All right. So here's an example of our trade code execution uh, on Android. Every, every Android before 4.1, you could execute any OS command because there was a JavaScript uh, interface running, which would take code from JavaScript and then use exec to execute the command. So you had simple command injection on Android. And there's a Drozer module that will look for these vulnerable JavaScript bridges if you want to, to see if an app has this feature turned on. Other communication mechanisms come up. One of these came up just last week. Somebody published as a vulnerability report that if you put something in the clipboard on a phone, other apps can see it. And that is certainly true, but I never thought of that as a vulnerability. I thought that was the whole point of the clipboard. That's how um, password managers typically work. You copy the password from the password manager app and paste it into a browser or something. But anyway, it certainly is true that the clipboard is basically read, write, accessible to every app and anything you put in the clipboard shouldn't be uh, considered all that secure. So Drozer has a command to read what's in the pack clipboard, if you like. Uh, also, a lot of apps use local sockets. You can just, just listen on the local address, and then you can send traffic to the local address, and that's one way to move data back and forth. And that means any app can connect to that. Um, and you could sniff it with a sniffer on the phone. And if you're sending it off to the internet, you can, of course, as we know, pick up the traffic with Wireshark or Burp or any of these products and steal what data is going over the network. So the data sent from one app to another over the network is, of course, subject to interception and attack. And that's why you should be using verified HTTPS. Uh, there is native code on the Android phone. We usually talk about this Java code that's compiled down to bytecode and executed in Smalley in a Java virtual machine, but you can compile code with C or C++ right down to assembly code and run it in native on the app as ARM um, binaries. Um, and if you want to do that, you then have to reverse it the same way you reverse, say, x86 or ARM desktop devices. Um, well, I cannot think of any ARM desktops very much, but ARM, ARM devices or, a, or x86, real assembly code, you have to use your IDA Pro to disassemble it. And then you've got the same buffer uh, vulnerabilities we do in CNET 127, buffer overflows, heap overflows, and so on. So it's uh, quite a chore. That is considered to be a relatively difficult activity, that kind of reverse engineering, far more difficult than reverse engineering, say, at the Smalley level, where we are, where you have stuff that really looks a lot like just plain source code to work with. All right, another thing you might do is allow application backups. This is true by default, and that means you can make a copy of the backups. Um, this is 
the, in, on iOS, this is the famous privacy issue. Um, iOS devices are encrypted, so the FBI can't get in, but almost everybody has iCloud turned on, and that's stored on a server, and Apple has the key, and they will cheerfully hand that over to the cops. So for most users, there is, in fact, no real issue of privacy of what's on your phone. It's available to the cops anyway. And you can make backups of your Android phone, and you can choose to encrypt them at the time you back up, but most people don't. And therefore, all the data that was stored privately in the app is now in the backup. So that's a way to do it, a way to steal data. There's a debuggable flag, which is false by default. But if you turn that on, then this allows you to run a debugger and examine the code execution while it's running, which sounds like good, clean, fun. It'd be good to put in the project. We haven't been debugging apps on Android phones. I've begun to do that on iOS phones. I haven't got either of those written up to the level of my formal projects yet, though. But it certainly is a nice, powerful technique. And of course, if you can run it in a debugger, then you can see everything. And so here you can just see uh, the transactions, putting the password in the database, for example, and other activities. They're all going to be in memory and available to a debugger. If you can debug an app, then you can stop it in the middle, see everything it's using, see the value of every variable, and so on you pretty much got total compromise. I hear some ads now on podcasts of some new product, which would claim to address this sort of vulnerability. Uh, there is a thing called homomorphic encryption, which has a, existed in theory for years, although it's so slow that no, or no practical applications. There is some company now advertising that they do homomorphic encryption, which means data is stored in an encrypted form and you search it and use it in an encrypted form without ever decrypting it, which is sort of insane, but it is the only possible defense against this sort of thing I can think of. Um, I don't know if any of that is really practical yet, but there's at least one company now claiming they've got some version of that working. All right, we talked about certificate pinning before. This is where you check for the CL certificate in, let me fix that typo, in more, uh, in more ways than just the default, so it won't accept a proxy. You can have root detection, where it detects using various techniques that the device is rooted and it won't run. And of course, you can fix that the way we did for the MADHAR app by just modifying the code to turn off those tests. Um, by the way, I should mention, uh, some, somebody's asked me about this um, before. There are commercial products like um, Dash O and uh, other one I can't remember the name of right now. There are, are obfuscation and protection products you can use to lock apps and make them harder and harder to modify. And uh, there, are, there are some that cost thousands of dollars, and they claim to use many techniques to detect tampering, rooting the phone, and many other things. So that they really claim they lock down your app behind many layers of security to, reverse, to prevent reverse engineering. ArcSan, that was it. I'm just going to put them up because somebody brought that up a few times. Um, ArcSan and Dash O. These are two commercial products, Dash O, there. If you want to prevent people from reverse engineering your app, you can buy these products. ArcSan is the most expensive and claims to be the strongest. Um, I don't know how good it is because they don't let you use a free trial, but it claims that they do many tests to make sure nobody is tampering with your app. Anyway, um, all right, here's, and we talked about this before. You can do this um, hooking, operating system hooking. So you modify what happens to an app without touching the app code, but instead modifying the API code that it has on Android. And that is one way to do it. Uh, this is what Cydia Substrate does and uh, other, a few other products to do it. Cydia Structs and Frida do this. Uh, I don't have, again, have any projects using those, but it would be a good thing to add to the course if I can get some of them working. All right, so I've got some cahoots. Can you use both one after another, double obfuscation? That's a good question, Watson, and I don't know the answer. Um, I would imagine you could, but I don't know. I'm imagining you wouldn't get any good out of doing that, but I'm just guessing. I haven't tried, Dasho has like a 15 day free trial. So I had a project at uh, one time where you tried using that to see what it did. All it did was change all your variable names to long strings. Archan has no free trial though. At least it didn't when I test, last tested it a couple of years ago. Anyway, let's try these uh, cahoots. Here they are, 128. And I hopefully have, okay, this looks right. I know running two firewalls at the same doesn't do any good. And I kind of doubt the two layers of obfuscation would make it better, but 
I don't know. Might be a few more coming. Might be a little bunch of them are asleep. We'll see. All right, I guess this is it. All right, which is the component that allows code execution via JavaScript? it, web views, that little browser inside your app. All right. Which data was widely available but then restricted after Android 4.1? command makes your permissions look like that. That's it, 644. This is one and one zero read write executes. That's four plus two plus zero is six, and those are both four. All right. Which feature is risky, but often used by password managers? Clipboard, of course. All right. So, I got rich, good. Good, sorry. An actual name here, which is good. And slippery otter. It's not going to get their points unless they come out of the closet. Okay. Anyway. All right. Well, I think that's it. I'm going to stop the recording and I'll leave the share on for a little while in case people have questions.